Okay, can you see that okay? Yep. All right, great. So we'll be looking at the judgment seat of Christ for the next three Wednesday evenings, God willing. And tonight we'll be looking at part one, which is what it is. And then at the end, this kind of a, a quick review of some of the rewards that are given at the judgment seat of Christ. So there are many more, but there are some mentioned in scripture. And then next week, Lord willing, we'll look at when it is. And I'm going to spend quite a bit of time giving uh, reasons for a pre-tribulation rapture of the church. That's something that's under attack right now. And uh, I want to spend a little time reinforcing that truth from scripture. There's a lot of oh, things like replacement theology, preterism that are creeping into some of our New Testament assemblies. And I think that, um, that the sad part about that is it causes us to look for the Antichrist instead of the, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then in the third part, we'll be looking at some of the things that the Lord will be considering at the judgment seat of Christ. Now, I just posted these messages on my YouTube channel. I want to give you that now. It's Henderson Publishing. And so if you want to relook at this message with a little greater clarity than what you get with the Zoom recording, that's fine. And also, I want to let you know about a two-part series I've just posted uh, entitled Current Events and Bible Prophecy. There's been a lot of interest in that, and those messages were just posted on my YouTube channel, Henderson Publishing, also. All right. So let's start by looking at the judgment seat of Christ. There's two verses here that I want to begin with. Uh, first one is in 2 Corinthians 5.10. It says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. And then also in Romans 14.10, Paul writes, for we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So we understand from these two verses that if you're born again and you're a child of God, you have a day of accountability with the Lord Jesus Christ. You personally will stand at his judgment seat and give an account. This is not a judgment of salvation. It's a judgment of works. Those works that um, have been done in the power of the Holy Spirit for the honor of the Lord Jesus Christ. The void of the flesh will be rewarded, and everything else will be lost. It will be burned up, and we'll be glad to see it go. So each of us that are born again have an accountability with the Lord Jesus Christ, and we're going to um, be rewarded for those things done for his honor and glory. Now, the there's three days that we'll be looking at tonight in the New Testament that are really important when we're talking about eschatology, which is the study of last things. We have the day of Christ, sometimes referred to as the day of the Lord Jesus Christ, or the day of Christ Jesus, or sometimes just that day. And we're going to see that this day is always longed for. Uh, the believer is longing, yearning for this day to come. It speaks of the rapture of the church and the judgment seat of Christ to follow. Our salvation for each of us began the same way. It started with an act of God. We heard the gospel message. We came under conviction. We stood with God against ourselves, agreeing with God on the matter of sin. We deserve judgment, but also we wanted to receive the free gift of salvation through Christ. And so when we ask to be saved, we acknowledge our sin, the God responds by regenerating us. And we all started our salvation by that way, an act of God called rebirth. And we can't get to heaven without being born again. We read that in John 3.3. 3. And so that starts a process of sanctification. So through being born again, through regeneration, we're saved from the penalty of sin. We become a child of God forever. But God is conforming us, we read in Romans 8, 29, to the moral excellencies of his son. And that's a process which is a little different for each of us. We have, <clears throat> excuse me, different bents. Um, 
different areas of growth. And so the Lord is working with each one of us individually. As we yield to the Spirit of God and the Word of God, he's, he's saving us from the power of sin. And then our salvation ends the same way as well. Some of us will die before the Lord's coming. Some of us will be alive when the Lord comes. But we'll all go through glorification. We'll get a Christ-like body. We read in Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. And that's the end of our salvation. The body is saved. We're saved from the presence of sin. And that's an act of God that's the same, excuse me, <clears throat> for all of us. So our salvation begins with an act. There's a process of sanctification and it ends with an act. Well, the day of Christ refers to that last act in which all our salvations will be complete. The body will be redeemed. We'll get a, a glorified body, a body fit for heaven. The bodies we have right now are not fit for heaven. So let's take a look at some of these passages. Let's first look at 1 Corinthians 1.8. You might recall that this is a church that was all out of order. Paul labors in this first epistle, which is actually the second epistle. We don't have the first epistle. But in this epistle, he is trying to put a church into order. He starts by upholding the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Seven times he refers to the Lord Jesus Christ in these first 10 verses. It's actually the highest concentration of the Greek word kyrios, which is translated Lord in scripture as tied with Christ. And so I think this is still a good application. If our assemblies are out of order, um, we're carnal, we're backbiting, um, we have our favorite preachers, there's doctrinal issues. What's going to bring the assembly back to order? Where does it start? Looking at Christ as our head and submitting to him. A lot of our troubles will go away. So he says in verse 7, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's speaking about believers yearning and waiting for the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. At that time, we read in verse 8, who, speaking Christ, will also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're not faultless. We still sin, but we are blameless in Christ. We have a position. We were justified in Christ that can't be lost. And so the end of that, the time that we're presented before God blameless is at the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the rapture will happen. We'll be caught up in the air with the Lord, and then we'll go back to heaven. We'll undergo the judgment seat of Christ, but at that point of glorification, when we're caught up in the air, our salvation will be complete. The body will be saved. We'll have a body fit for heaven. So when we think about this day, the day of the Lord Jesus Christ, as far as the believer is concerned, we have today. How are we living today for the Lord? And then we have that day where we're going to give accountability for how we live today in the Lord. So that's the way that we should go through each and every day, thinking about this day and that day. And let's flip over to chapter 5, verse 5. We have a man who is in unrepentant sin in the assembly. He's having a relationship with his father's wife, presumably his stepmother. Um, he's puffed up about it. In fact, many in the assembly are puffed out, up about this sin. Uh, the Cor Corinthians seem to have um, the motto that we're saved by grace, that's party. We can do whatever we want. Paul tells us in Romans 6, God forbid uh, that we continue sin, that grace may abound. Uh, the whole idea is to, we should be sinning less as we mature in Christ. We should be given over to holiness. And so Paul says in verse 4, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul is saying, I only have to be among you. We're in the spirit. Uh, I'm one with you in spirit. Judge this man. Put him out of the assembly. He is not in fellowship with the Lord. Our, our relationship with each other goes up before it comes down. 
we can't be in fellowship together if either one of us is out of fellowship with the Lord. So this man is out of fellowship with the Lord. Paul says he can't possibly be in fellowship with you. Put him out of the assembly, else he's going to leaven the entire assembly. Notice he'll be given over to Satan. Uh, there'll be repercussions of being put under discipline. And it could be he even dies, speaking of the destruction of the flesh. But his spirit will be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. This man's a believer. He can't lose his salvation. But as John tells us in 1 John 5, there are sins unto death. And uh, this man could have been taken home in uh, disobedience. It would have been uh, a terrible way to enter the Lord's presence. Thankfully, I believe uh, the second epistle in chapter 2, that this man did repent and was restored to the assembly. The point here is the spirit of this man would be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's when he would get a glorified body, even if he died. And that's, for the sake of time, just flip over to Philippians 1. Paul talks about the day of Christ three times in the opening portion of his epistle to the Philippians. He says in verse 6, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a really encouraging verse. Uh, the Lord is perfecting us, maturing us, uh, bringing us along. He loves us too much to leave us the way we are. And so we can be confident that he has started a work in us. He's going to complete it. When is that work complete? At the day of Jesus Christ. And then in verse 10, he says that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere without offense till the day of Christ. So it's possible to do um, good things with wrong attitudes or bad attitudes, um, even with sinful desires. Uh, Paul is instructing them to prove what is excellent, do what's sincere without offense, and that should guide our conduct till the day of Christ. After that, we won't have the opportunity to serve the Lord as we do today. Um, our ministry, our strangership on earth will be over and we'll be in the presence of the Lord. And then just one more verse, Second uh, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 16. He says, holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I may have not run in vain and labored in vain. So he, Paul was looking forward to the being in the Lord's presence with the Philippian believers. He says something very similar to the church at Thessalonica about them being crowned of rejoicing. And so it was something that Paul really looked forward to. And I think that's going to be one of the spectacular things when we're in the presence of the Lord is seeing what Christ has accomplished in each one of us in his presence. And we'll be looking on each other saying, wow, look at what the Lord did to you with you. And uh, seeing the radiance of Christ, the reflective glory in each of us uh, for eternity of glistening the grace of Christ, it will be exciting to see. I want to be careful that we keep these three days, the dates, the three special days that are talked about in the New Testament clear. We've talked about the day of Christ, which represents the, the rapture, Christ coming for his church, and the judgment seat of Christ, which happens immediately afterwards. But that's not to be confused with the day of the Lord. So we have the, the day of Christ, we have the day of the Lord. Uh, the day of the Lord is an Old Testament term that spoke of Jehovah God coming down from heaven and visibly and powerfully judging wickedness. That was the day of the Lord. Uh, the book of Joel uses the term uh, a number of times to, to speak of the tribulation period being the day of the Lord. And that's something that the New Testament also upholds. Uh, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 11, Paul is talking about the tribulation period, and he refers to that seven-year period as the day of the Lord. 
So that's in keeping with how it's introduced in the Old Testament. And then I'd like to you to turn your Bibles to 2 Peter 3. And we'll continue thinking about the day of the Lord. And then we're also will be introduced to the day of God. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in a night. By the way, anytime you see that expression in scripture, the, the Lord's coming as a thief in a night, this is speaking of a, a, the judgment of the wicked. It's not used as an expression speaking of the redeemed. The redeemed are expecting Christ's return, but the wicked aren't expecting Christ to return to judge them. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. The elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will burn up. Therefore, since all things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So the tribulation period is spoken of as the day of the Lord. First Thessalonians 5 agrees with Joel 2. Uh, Peter tells us that the day of the Lord ends when this earth and the heaven that we see passes away. It's going to burn up with fervent heat. And then afterwards, that begins the day of God, which is the eternal state. So the day of the Lord in the New Testament speaks of when Jehovah God, through Christ, will be judging wickedness on the earth during the tribulation period, and then also Christ reigning, ensuring that wickedness will not raise its ugly head during his millennial kingdom. He'll be ruling the entire earth with justice and righteousness, and his glory will fill the earth, and he will not tolerate any rebellion against his authority. And then after the last rebellion of Satan, when he's loosed out of the bottomless pit and deceives the, the nations to rebel against Christ, the earth is destroyed. We read this at the end of Revelation chapter 20. And then in Revelation 21, in the first verse, we read of a new heaven and a new earth, just as Peter is describing here. And then we get into the eternal state. It, it's my thinking that in the eternal state, a lot of the divisions um, the specific people groups and of the redeemed that we see throughout scripture and even in the millennial kingdom will disappear and it'll just be God's redeemed with him forever and ever. No sin, there'll be uh, no wickedness. We'll just be in God's presence, enjoying worshiping him forever and ever. So these three days, the, the, the day of Christ, the day of the Lord and the day of God are three key days we're thinking about future events. All right, let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And Paul gives us some specific teaching about the judgment seat of Christ. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 11. Well, this is a foundational verse on many respects. He says, for no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Uh, until we're born again and we know Christ as Savior, we can't even serve him. Nothing really counts for eternity. It's only after we've been born again, based on the gospel message, the true gospel message, we've been born again, and then we're yielding to his headship and his authority. So he becomes the basis, the foundation of everything that happens that can be rewarded for the believer's life. If you take Christ out of the equation, there's nothing to be gained. So it's based on this fundamental truth of who Christ is, his gospel message, and his headship. So on this foundation, verse 12, now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. 
if anyone's work, which he has built on it, endures, he will receive a reward. Now listen to verse 15. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved yet as through fire. Again, the judgment seat of Christ is not a judgment of salvation. That is determined when one's born again. We're justified in Christ. We're a child of God. You can't be unborn. Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 1 that the Holy Spirit seals our salvation and the Spirit of God himself is God's earnest, his pledge to complete what he started. And the Holy Spirit takes up resonance within us. But we have a judgment of works. And so he talks about gold, silver, and precious stones. And so as we're looking at the New Testament for what types of works this would include, obviously, it has to be accomplished by Christ through us. It has to be done in the power of the Holy Spirit. The Lord told his disciples the, the night before he went to the cross in John 15, verse 5, you can do nothing without me. It's only when we're conduits, available conduits of God's blessing, the Spirit of God works through us, that it counts for eternity. And then in 1 Corinthians 9, 17, Paul says, if I do the thing willingly, I get a reward. God doesn't coerce us into serving him. He gives us the opportunity to serve him. Ephesians 2 and verse 10, we read that God has been so good to give us these works that we can walk in. He's predestined these works for us to walk in. He doesn't force us to walk in them, but he's given us opportunity to serve him. So done willingly, it's uh, done for the Lord in the right motives. In other words, we're, we're doing it for his honor and glory. We're not doing it for money. We're not doing it to be seen by others. We're not doing it to get an, an attaboy from somebody else. We're not like the, uh, the Pharisee and Matthew 6 who is seeking the praise of others. Uh, he was praying out loud, but he wasn't praying to God. He was praying so other men would hear him and think well of him. So those things that are done by the power of the Holy Spirit for Christ's honor and glory, those, those works that are done willingly, not for selfish gain, not for carnal uh, motives, those are rewarded. And that's the gold, silver, and precious stones. And in the presence of the Lord, these works will survive the judgment. But in his scrutiny and the fiery judgment of these works, everything else will be burned up. And when we are standing before the Lord in all of his glory, we will be glad to see them burned up. Oh, Lord, just get that out of here. That's, that has a stench of pride. That, that was all me. That wasn't for you. We will agree with them about it. We'll be glad to see those things go. We'll only want in the Lord's presence what glorifies him. It's interesting that in Philippians chapter 2, Paul speaks of a day when every knee will bow before the Lord Jesus Christ. And every tongue will confess that he is Lord. And it's interesting that the Greek verb translated confess is in the middle voice, which means the subject is doing the action on its own behalf. There's a choice to be made. It's not the passive voice. That means God would be forcing people to say Jesus Christ is Lord. So think of that scene at the great white throne judgment talked about in Revelation 20, when all the wicked are raised up, their souls come out of Hades, the graves and the sea give up their bodies. There's a resurrection and all these wicked people stand before the Lord in all of his glory and the worst people in human history, Hitler, Mao, I mean, the list is long. They look up at Christ and they see all of his spectacular glory and they willingly bow the knee and say, he is Lord. That gives us a little taste of how fantastic the presence of the Lord must be for even these wicked souls to see Christ and say, he is Lord. We'll be glad to see everything burned up that doesn't honor him. 
you know, his glory will be so spectacular. We won't want anything to diminish it. Second Corinthians chapter 4, 17 gives us another verse for the basis of what these rewards gain for us. <clears throat> Sometimes I hear believers say, well, I'm serving the Lord because I love him. I'm not doing it for the rewards. And I think we understand what a person means when they're saying that. They just love the Lord. But we need to understand that the rewards that we gain will give us the opportunity to appreciate heaven in a greater way and a greater opportunity to worship and adorn the Lord with his own glory. So Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 17, for our light affliction is but for a moment and works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Glory has a weight to it. Now, a few chapters later, in chapter 12, Paul tells us a little bit about his light affliction. He didn't want to, have to boast, but the Corinthians were challenging his apostleship. So they forced him into boasting. And so he wants to assert his credentials. He wouldn't uh, go through all that he had if he hadn't been called by God and empowered by God to do so. And so he tells them, I was, I was scourged five times. Tacticus tells us that 50% of the people went under the Roman scourge died. It was such a terrible beating. He was beaten by rods three times. He was stoned and left for dead at Lystra. That doesn't sound like light affliction to me at all. But to Paul, it was. Because he knew that that affliction was working for him an eternal weight of glory. In Romans 8, Paul says, it's not even worth comparing our sufferings now to the glory that's to come. And so suffering must precede glory, but glory will come. And so Paul says that um, our light afflictions are working for us an eternal weight of glory. Now, turn with me to Revelation chapter 19. And verse 8, and that's let's look at how this translates the rewards and the glory associated with the rewards to um, how it's going to be used in heaven to honor the Lord Jesus Christ. So the scene in Revelation 19, we're at the end of the tribulation period. Uh, the Lord is getting ready to come back to the earth. He's been opening these seals on the scroll that he got from the hand of the Father in Revelation chapter 5. It's a title deed of the kingdom. He's going to return to earth, vindicate his name. The battle of Armageddon will occur. The Antichrist and his armies will be wiped out. He'll come into Jerusalem. Jerusalem's already captured by the enemy. He's going to release the Jews, uh, the, the remnant that's been refined, sealed, um, protected, and he's going to um, destroy all that have come against uh, his, uh, the Jewish people. And so in Revelation chapter 19, we have this scene in heaven right before this all happens, the second coming of Christ, and we have the redeemed in heaven, and it says in verse 7, let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. I think the King James reads the righteousnesses of the saints. And so there is a practical righteousness reflected in the attire of the bride, re referring to the redeemed. It's at least a church. It might be the Old Testament saints. We'll talk more about that next week. But this is the, the church definitely is coming back with Christ at his second advent. And so her attire is a reflective glory re showing all the righteous acts that survived the judgment seat of Christ and now has this 
ongoing glow from her. Uh, it has a reflective glory about her. It's what Christ accomplished in his people that is now outshining the very excellencies of Christ. First Corinthians 15, please. Now, this is a chapter where Paul is, is talking about the resurrection. There were some in Corinth, some teachers that were teaching some of the saints that the resurrection of Christ didn't happen. Paul is very adamant. There's no gospel without the resurrection of Christ. And so he includes the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ in verses 3 and 4 as being the gospel message. That's what we have to believe and trust in in the church age to be saved. And he gives a number of reasons why Christ had to be raised from the dead. If Christ had just died on the cross and wasn't raised from the dead, at best, we would be just forgiven dead people because we are dead in trespasses and sin. We were born condemned, John 3.18. And so if we trusted Christ, we could get forgiveness for our sins, but we'd have no life, no eternal life. We'd just be forgiven dead people. But Christ did raise from the dead. And through the act of the Holy Spirit, we are made one with Christ. We have his life. It's an eternal life. We're one with him. So Paul says if Christ had not raised from the dead, we'd be men most miserable. We'd be suffering for nothing. Uh, we'd have no hope. But because he did raise from the dead, we aren't suffering for nothing. And we do have a, a blessed hope. Towards the end of the chapter, he starts to explain about our glorified bodies, our resurrected bodies. And he uses two illustrations. First, he talks about a grain, uh, a corn of grain that goes in the ground and has to die, germinates in order to produce a plant. That's in verses 35 through 38. He says in 37, what you sow, you do not know that the body that shall be, but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain, but God gives it a body as he pleases and to each seed its own body. So if you put a kernel of wheat in the ground, it perishes, it germinates, and it, it produces a plant. The plant is not the seed, but the plant is derived from the seed. And so what Paul is saying is that our physical bodies now, our earthly bodies, is like that seed that goes in the ground and is perished, and our glorified bodies will draw characteristics from that seed, but it's not the seed. That's why I believe that we'll know each other in heaven. Whatever God's best thoughts of you are, in perfection, that's what you'll be in heaven. And we'll have bodies that will never have another stinking thought about another brother or sister. Uh, we'll, only, we'll be able to focus perfectly. We won't have anything that would hinder us from worshiping. <laughs> Nobody aches or pains. I won't need these glasses anymore. Um, will this be in perfection what God's best idea of us is, each one of us? I, just a, a thought that popped on my mind in Revelation 2, when the letter goes to the church of Smyrna from the Lord, he speaks of a, a white stone that has a, a peculiar name on it, a special name on it that's given to each believer. And so even though there'll be hordes of redeemed people, souls in heaven, each one of us will still be able to have a special intimacy with the Lord that nobody else can really enter into. It's hard for us to contemplate that here because we're time dependent. But in heaven, we won't be time dependent. And we'll be able to enjoy the Lord's presence in a very special way, an intimate way. Point here is that the righteous the attire of the bride is a reflection of the righteous works that survive the judgment seat of Christ. The Lord told the church at Laodicea, oh, you're naked. I wish you would buy for me fine white linen garments. They didn't have uh, practical righteousness, and they were naked, so to speak, spiritually. And so this is a, a thought that continues through the book of Revelation. 
And in 1 Corinthians 15, as Paul is explaining these two illustrations of the resurrected body, we can see how this all ties together. Look at the next example in verse 40. There are also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies, but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, but one star differs from another star in glory. Mark this. So also is the resurrection of the dead. Now, on a very dark night, if you look up with the naked eye, you can see about 3,000 stars. And we can discern that they have different magnitudes, they're different sizes, different colors, a lot of distinction. Some stars are brighter than other stars. And Paul's saying that in the resurrection, some saints are going to shine brighter than other saints. It's that reflective glory of Christ that is retained from the judgment seat of Christ. It is the attire of the bride. It's what Christ has accomplished in this that is shown outwardly. And so it isn't, we'll all enjoy heaven. We'll all appreciate the Lord. Um, God is looking for something wonderful to praise each one of us about. But the aftermath of the judgment seat of Christ ensures that some saints will have more brilliance of the splendor of Christ about them than others, an outshining brilliance, because our light affliction is working for us an eternal weight of glory. First John chapter 2. In verse 28, John speaks of at least the potential of some being ashamed at Christ's appearing. He says, now little children, abide in him, and that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. He's just saying, live for the Lord. Live this day in light of that day, and then you won't be ashamed. We don't want to be caught with our hand in the cookie jar at the the rapture of the church we're to be watching and waiting living each and every day as if the lord's coming back we don't want to be ashamed and he says in verse 2 of the next chapter first uh, john 3 2 beloved now we are children of god it has not yet been revealed what we shall be but we know that we that when he is revealed we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. Again, Paul says in Philippians 3.20, we get a Christ-like body. It's a glorified body. It's a body that cannot sin. Does The carnal nature is obliterated that we got from Adam. Everyone who has this hope purifies himself just as he, speaking of Christ, is pure. So if we're looking for the Lord, it has a purifying effect on us. We don't want to get caught with our hand in the cookie jar. So in the, the final few minutes here, I just want to briefly talk about five crowns that are mentioned in scripture. And again, there, there are likely many more. There is the, the crown of life. And this is back in James chapter one, or if you're in first John forward to James chapter one. And he's speaking here to, he started by talking about trials in verse two that these trials work patience. God uses testing and trials to weave in this characteristic of patience into our faith. It's, it's, there's no other way to accomplish it than through hardship. And then he says in verse 12, blessed is the man who endures. And the word here in the Greek just means a proof of something. When we hear the word temptation, it has a negative connotation, but the Greek word could easily be translated testing. It's just the proof of something. Blessed is the man who endures testing. He's proven through testing. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. So the crown of life is promised to those who just patiently endure trials. They trust the Lord. They understand that 
Christ is seated at the right hand of majesty on high. Ephesians 2, 6, I'm co-seated with him in heavenly places. Everything that comes into my life comes into his life. I'm just resting in him. I believe all beneficial spiritual exercise begins when we rest in Christ. We get up into the heavenlies and rest in him in heavenly places. And then I talked about the crown of rejoicing. It's mentioned in Philippians 4.1 more explicitly in 1 Thessalonians 2.19. And this is, most commentators believe, is the soul-winning crown. He who wins souls is wise. So there's a special crown given to those who enjoy um, are obedient to the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 19 through 20, and also the Lord's command in Acts 1, 8 to be witnesses for him. Let's look at 2 Timothy 4, 8. And this is the crown of righteousness, 2 Timothy 4, 8. Now, as far as we know, this was the last epistle that Paul wrote to his spiritual son, Timothy. It's during his second imprisonment, Roman imprisonment. Um, his situation is not going well. Nero is Caesar. And it looks like Paul is coming to the end of his life. And he, he understands that. He has no regrets. He says in verse 6, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And I'm so glad there isn't a period there. It goes on, and not to me only, but also to all who love his appearing. And so this crown of righteousness is it's a crown that, every one of us can earn by just living each and every day as if the Lord could come back that day. Uh, the Lord's return is not immediate, but it is imminent. It could happen at any time. So Paul says, I will get this reward. That's the way that I live my life, and others, believers who live that way, can get that reward also. Then there is the, the crown of glory, which is in 1 Peter 5, 4. This is given to not just church elders, but those elders who shepherd God's flock well. It's a very hard work. God's people, his sheep, they, they stink, they kick, they bite, they glare, uh, they wander. It's a hard work. But for those elders who love the Lord, they'll find the wherewithal to take care of his sheep. And I think that's the point the Lord was making in John 21 with Peter. Uh, for Peter to tend the Lord's lambs and care for his sheep, he was going to have to love the Lord above all things. That's the sticking power. It's like marriage. I tell young people, don't marry anybody that loves you more than the Lord. It won't work. But if you love the Lord, he's your first love. That's the sticking power in other relationships. We want to do whatever we can to thrive with other people uh, according to the Lord's will because we love the Lord. And let's look at one more, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Paul is using the race analogy once again. It's a frequent illustration. He uses it in Philippians chapter 3. He talks about this higher calling that he has. He's looking forward to the finish line, which is death or the rapture. And a lot of the texts, he includes himself in 1 Thessalonians 4, which we'll look at next week, and 1 Corinthians 15, 51, 52, includes himself. He thought he would be raptured, and he lived in light of that, that hope, that blessed hope. And so um, Paul, is he's going to run the race. He's, the finish line is when God calls him home, either through death or the rapture of the church. And here he, he uses this analogy again of, of a physical race. He says, do you not know, in verse 24, that those who run in a race all run, but one receives a prize, run in such a way that you may attain it. So he's talking about a physical race where there's a bunch of competitors competing against each other. One person's going to get the wreath. It was a perishable wreath made of 
ferns, flowers, some kind of foliage, but in a few days it withered up. It was a perishable crown. It goes on in verse 25, and everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an incorruptible crown. Therefore, I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. That word disqualified is the same Greek word translated cast away in Hebrews 6, unusable. And so Paul isn't suggesting that we're racing each other. We have different callings, different gifts in the body of Christ. Each one of us has a work of ministry we read in Ephesians 4 to do to edify uh, the body of Christ. But Paul's thinking about a different race here with his flesh. He says, I know what's within me. I know this carnal nature within me. I know what it can do. And so he didn't shadow box it. He landed the blows on himself to keep his flesh, that carnal nature, in submission to the Spirit of God. The Word of God and the Spirit of God, if, as we yield to it and not give in to the impulses of the flesh, then we become fruitful servants of the Lord. He said, I don't want to be disqualified. I don't want to become unusable. I don't want to become sidelined in the race. We're either pursuing that finish line. Uh, we're, we're, we're either living out this high calling every day or we're sidelined. There's no middle ground. The whole idea of being a backslidden Christian is foreign to scripture. It's always a backsliding believer that terminology is used without scripture. It's an active departure from truth. We're either actively pursuing the Lord, obeying him, or we've chosen to not. And as soon as we do that, we become unusable in the work of God. So those who, again, they control their lust of the flesh, they yield to the spirit of God, they mortify the deeds of the flesh, Colossians 3.13. They um, these will get the incorruptible crown. And again, there's probably many, many more rewards given at the judgment seat, but these five give us a little bit of an idea of some of the things that the Lord will reward. I just want to close tonight by looking at Revelation chapter 411. It's a portion of scripture that is precious to us. The redeems in heaven. I believe the church is in heaven, pictured in the, the elders, the 24 elders sitting around the throne of God. The lamb is on the throne. The elders have crowns on their heads. We know from chapter five that these elders are redeemed from the earth. So they were their souls, They're, they have bodies, uh, they have rewards on their heads. And it's at least a church, possibly Old Testament saints. I remember asking Bill McDonald one time, I said, Bill, I can argue both ways. If the Old Testament saints are raptured with the church at Christ's coming, or they, are, they go through glorification at the end of the tribulation with Israel. I asked him, which is it? And he said, Warren, I can tell you that the Old Testament saints will either be raptured with the church at the start of the tribulation or with Israel at the end of the tribulation. I said, thank you very much, Bill. That was so helpful. And, you know, I can find verses on both sides of that. But it's at least a church here. And we have the scene in heaven. It's a beautiful scene, the throne room of God. And, and we have this Shekinah glory of, of God being described in jasper and emerald and sardis and the circular rainbow around the throne and the four living creatures flying above God's throne calling out holy 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 is the lord of hosts and seven flames of fire before the throne um, symbolizing the holy spirit and then we have these 24 elders around the throne sitting on their smaller thrones and they have crowns on their head and we read that in verse 10, the 24 elders fell down before him who sit on the throne and worshiped him 
who lives forever and ever and casts her crowns before the throne saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, power, for you are cre created all things. And by your will, they exist and were created. So it's a beautiful picture. I don't believe that this is a one-time event where we just throw our crowns towards the Lord on the throne. It's interesting in Revelation 12, 15 and 16, the same Greek word is translated pour. And I think that's the idea. We, we are pouring out worship to the Lord. What Lord has enabled us to do from the judgment seat of Christ, this reflective glory is what we're going to be reflecting back to the Lord. What the Lord has accomplished in us that withstood the judgment seat of Christ is going to give us an opportunity for eternity to appreciate heaven and to have a weight of glory to worship the Lord. This is really exciting to think about. Um, next week, we'll be thinking about the um, when the rapture of the church will occur. We've been thinking about what it is tonight, a judgment of works that give us a, a weight of glory, an opportunity to worship uh, the Lord forever and ever. Father, we want to thank you for our study this evening. Uh, thank you for these rich truths that have been tucked away in scripture for our appreciation. Um, we yearn, oh God, to see your son. We yearn to see him in all of his glory. We, we yearn to see those wounds of Calvary, which have purchased our redemption, the blood that flowed. And we just pray, Father, that you would help us to live in light of this day because of that day, and that we would be thrilled uh, to do whatever we can right now to enhance our our time in heaven that we can just give Christ all the glory that he deserves. We ask this in his name. Amen. Yeah.